Can you hear me? Okay, good. If I have not met you yet, my name is Pastor Jen, and as of this Tuesday, this coming Tuesday, I will have been here with you guys at Arlington Assembly for four months. Don't mind me, I just wet my pants before I came up here. Um, today's a really special day for me because not, I mean, even though I've only been here four months, I have had relationship with Arlington and Assembly for a couple of years now, and I have been up here speaking to you twice before. But today is the first time as one of your pastors, and that is really special to me. I'd also like to thank my Grove Church family. They came here. Raise your hands if you're here, Grove Church. They came here to see if you're taking good care of me. <laughs> They are, they are. They're taking really good care of me. Okay, so I want to ask you guys something. Why do you come to church? Or why do you come to Jesus? We all come from different circumstances, life situations, and backgrounds. And so that answer is different for all of us. Some of us come to be encouraged and be with like-minded people. Some of us are just simply curious and wonder what the pastor is going to say. Some of us need something that's going to help us face the world and the harsh reality that waits us when we walk back out those doors. And some of us, like we're all in. We get so excited to come here. We, we want to be part of it. We want to serve. We want to hear what Jesus is going to say and, and just be all about it. And some of us, desperately need healing, desperately need healing, both spiritually and physically. But that's only one dynamic of why we all come here. There's another part, and Pastor Sam talked about it last week when he opened us up. When he mentioned at the Sermon on the Plain, that's where we're at, that there was three types of people there. Some were simply curious. What is Jesus going to say? What is he going to do? Some were kind of casual followers. They're like, I like him. I'm about him. Let's see what happens. And some were all in disciples. Yeah, yeah full followers of Jesus. This is important. It's an important element because we will see that who you are and why you're there can affect the attitude you carry when you hear Jesus' words. For the Sermon on the Plain specifically, we know that all three groups came to hear what he had to say and be healed. And a great multitude of them, all of them, it says, this is my favorite part, they all tried to touch him. Let's read it again, starting in verse 17 from last week, and then we'll end up in 21 where we are now. And he came down with them, and he stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea and Jerusalem and the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon, who came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all the crowd sought to touch him, for power came out from him and healed them all. Pay attention here. And then he lifted up his eyes on his disciples. And he said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for every time that you opened your mouth and all the disciples who recorded it, all the writers who recorded it so that we could hear and, and learn from you today. The situations, the circumstances, your great love and, and your backwards kingdom that makes no sense to all of us, but we trust you. Lord, I pray that you would cleanse my heart and make me an open and willing vessel, a ready vessel to share what you have today, Lord God. And I pray all the hearts out here would be prepared. Ears would be opened, Lord God. Lives would be changed, Lord God, to your glory. Be with us today. Help us to understand by your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. 
Let's give a little background on the book of Luke. In the Gospel of Luke, Jesus' Jesus's mission is framed a little bit differently. He has double the content any other of the other Gospels have, and he says things in a different way. For instance, Jesus' genealogy in Luke is tr traced back to Adam all the way to the beginning, not stopping with Abraham as in Matthew. This suggests a connection to all of humanity. That's important, not just the religious or political elite. As another example in Luke, angels appear to common folk like the shepherds, and most significantly, to the ladies. In Matthew, angels only appear to men. When you think of this and the fact that Simeon and Anna, otherwise unknown individuals of no known social status, are the ones who give credit to Jesus' divine mission when he is eight days old, not the wise men from the east, just like Matthew. So when I say not, it's not contradicting Matthew. It's saying Matthew focused on these people, Luke focuses on these people. Because Matthew's gospel was for the religious, Luke's is for kind of the outcasts, right? So it suggests Jesus' connection to those who are otherwise outside the circles of power and influence. Finally, in Luke, Jesus himself is recorded as publicly reading from Isaiah 61 in his hometown. The verses he reads suggests that the focus of his ministry is the poor, the brokenhearted, the captive, the blind, and the bound. When you think about the impact of all of this, in Luke's gospel, Jesus is most closely connected to those who might seem to be on the margins of society who are ready to receive the salvation that Jesus offers today. And all of this matters because it informs how Luke intended us to read the Sermon on the Plain. So think about it. We were told Jesus, but before he preaches the Sermon on the Plain, we know that Jesus has already been in ministry and tension is building between the way him and his disciples act and how other leaders and their disciples act. And after a night of praying, and Jesus, having just chosen his 12 disciples, a crowd gathers to hear him speak at his first public event after having chosen those 12. And they're curious. They're curious, or they're beginning to follow him, or they're all in, and they want to know what he has to say and to be healed. These three groups also have the following in common. They were li living under the oppressive rule of the Roman Empire. This is excessive taxation, um, denied freedoms, and persecution. These people desperately needed the heavenly perspective and hope of an eternal inheritance that Christ presents in this whole sermon. They needed hope and healing. So Jesus, knowing that, chooses to hone in on his dis disciples, the all-in followers, fully aware that everyone else is listening in. He focuses on them, and he talks about an upside-down kingdom. It's similar to the Sermon on the Mount, but he's focusing in on the all-in disciples and what their life is going to be like. Some of these people may have heard the Sermon on the Mount when he starts off with his blessed are those, and they may be thinking, you keep using that word. <laughs> I don't think it means what you think it means. He keeps saying blessed. By the way, that was for my friend Charlotte. She's never watched Princess Bride, and we made her watch it, and she said she doesn't like it, so the, uh, we're going to uh, throw stuff at her after service. <laughs> he keeps saying blessed. He's already done this sermon before. He's doing it again, and he's saying blessed again. Throughout this sermon, Jesus points to eternity and commands us to be far-sighted, to live in sight of heaven, in light of heaven. And that's going to take an attitude check. I mean, you come here expecting one thing and God tells you the unexpected. The unexpected that you've actually already heard before. What's your attitude going to be? He tells you a sermon you've heard before and seems to be emphasizing um, those on the margins while eyes are locked on his disciples. 
So this whole sermon is going to build off the point before it. So it's important that like when Sam preaches last week and I preach this week, we're taking these verse by verse that you pay attention and then add to that what you learn the next week. This is really important for your study at home too because it's going to be so rich to you. So let's remember that Sam told us last week that Jesus started off with addressing their salvation or lack thereof saying, blessed are the poor. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit who humbly admit their need of a savior. But given the information we know about Luke and how and why he writes, we also know that Jesus means blessed are the literally, financially, and socially poor, the outcasts. His heart is for the outcasts. Okay, so these people came to hear what he had to say and be healed. So he starts off with, blessed are the poor, the hungry, and the weeping. Huh? <laughs> That's like, this is a terrible analogy, but here we go. That's like you hearing that I'm going to throw with all this amazing, like, it's not amazing. I hate it, actually. I think I'm part vampire and should live in forks. The heat. <laughs> We have been having this, this weather in, in Washington. It's brutal. And you hear Jen's going to throw an ice cream party. Oh, my word. We have got to go to this ice cream party. I've, you just are you're dying to see what this ice cream's going to about, how it's going to taste, how it's going to change your life. And in fact, before my party, I've just chosen some of you to be my ice cream ambassadors. These are the all-in ice cream people. And so you all show up to my party, and I look straight at those of you who I know really love ice cream. And you're going to be on board with this ice cream that I'm supposedly about to share. And I say, blessed are you who want to taste ice cream. You're going to get it someday. What is your attitude going to be? You may be a little aghast. Why is Jen looking specifically at the people who are ice cream junkies? She just chose us to fight for the ice cream. Where's the ice cream? Does she even have ice cream? She's a tease. And listen, we need this ice cream. It's been hot. It's like she's adding insult to injury. Luke tells us plainly that Jesus spoke the Sermon on the Plain with his eyes on his disciples. Keep thinking on that. Picture it. Though, though multitudes had come to hear him, this sermon was primarily for those who wished to follow him and were all in. That observation must guide us as we study the sermon, but we must also notice that God is intentional about the fact that the rest of the audience is listening in. Remember, the book of Luke was written by a Gentile doctor, that's Luke, for a Gentile audience. So those reading about this encounter after the fact, us today, or even the Gentiles that were present, get to see that this message is for anyone who is willing to be all in. For anyone who could possess an attitude of the all in. And Jesus says, blessed which means highly favored of God, are all of you leading wretched lives right now or will be leading wretched lives at some point? Yay! Remember, this is a manifesto of an upside-down kingdom. What Jesus is saying is God's love brings a reversal of the world's value systems and it's for all who hear and obey. That is an all-in attitude. God wants you to be all in, rejecting religious hypocrisy. The religious pride themselves on not being hungry, on not weeping, because Jesus uses some of the same words he used on the Sermon on the Mount. We know that he means those who are spiritually poor, hungry and thirsty, but, we know what, but because we know what we do with the writings of Luke, we also know that Jesus is focused on people who are financially poor and are physically hungry. So we must add that to the meaning of the Sermon on the Mount. Sam said, Jesus says, blessed are the poor for yours is the kingdom of God. That's important. Blessed are the hungry now for you shall be filled. In Luke, Jesus' message is one of deliverance today. 
from the real life challenges faced by those who are most vulnerable in society. The Sermon on the Plain seems to suggest that addressing the physical needs of these individuals is among one of the main concerns of Jesus and opens up the idea that all of his followers were to meet the basic needs of those around us as well as the spiritual. People came to the Sermon on the Plain to what? Hear what he had to say and be healed. Why did Jesus come to the Sermon on the Plain? Jesus came to the Sermon on the Plain for those who would actually hear him and prove it by obeying. Those who had an attitude of all in. Because listen, there are people here today and in any audience of any sermon at any time that grew up in church but never grew up in Christ. These people say, yeah, I'm Christian, but I'm not going to give up this. Or, yeah, I follow Christ, but my career always comes first. I follow Christ, but my kids are always going to come first. I follow Christ, but my hobbies come first. I'm not giving up this. And you know what else? My politics come first. These people may be church people and beautiful church people, but they're not Christ people. Remember, Jesus in verse 20 looked straight at his disciples, locked eyes, and said, Yo, everything about me you heard, have heard is different. My kingdom is different. Sam opened last week with Jesus' first blessing that blessed are the poor for they will have the kingdom of heaven, meaning blessed are those who humble themselves and admit they're nothing without him. To them will come heaven. He's saying blessed are those who are destitute in spirit and mourn their spiritual state. Not only that, but blessed are those who suffer in all kinds of ways now. To those people, he says, I see you. I have blessings for you. And it is hard to accept this and live this out. But those who do have amazing things coming. They're blessed. Blessed are the poor. That's upside down. But he goes on. And here's where we're landing today. You know, funny side note, I told my friend Megan yesterday, she goes, what are you preaching on? I said, blessed are the hungry and the weeping. She goes, oh, the hangry. <laughs> I said, yes, I'm going to use that, Megan. Thank you. Blessed are the hungry. He says, blessed are the hungry. Hungry here. We're going to have a little scholar, scholarly time here. Hungry here that is fervently seeking. The Greek word for hungry is pay now. It means both to starve painfully and suffer as well as to crave ardently or seek with eager desire painfully crave and ardently desire the ways of God for you will be filled. The word pay now kind of, kind of cracks me up because to remember how to pronounce it, I put it in my notes as pay now. And that's just it, isn't it? We're hungry and desperate now. We're paying now, paying the price, price now, but we will be filled. It'll pay off. We've already discussed that Jesus is talking both spiritually poor and hungry as well as people who are literally poor and hungry because in the Sermon on the Mount, um, we know he's talking of spiritual matters. But here in Luke, remembering, too, that he's speaking to all of his disciples, they're the, they're the key interest here, the all-inners, we understand that he's honoring those, here we go, he's honoring those who had or would become poor and hungry on his account, physically as well as spiritually. And when I say spiritually, I mean they hunger for his ways and weep for the state of the world. So blessed are those who hunger and thirst, for they will be filled. Blessed are the hangry. That's going to stick with me forever. Blessed are the hangry. It could be paraphrased as follows. Deeply joyful. And spiritually whole are those who actively seek right relationship with God. And in so doing, 
discovered that he alone can satisfy their souls. Now let's focus on the word weep. In Greek, it's klayo, and it means to wail aloud as a sign of pain and grief. And laugh is not just like ha-ha laugh. It means to be merry, happy, and to rejoice. In John 16, 20, Jesus promised his faithful ones, truly I tell you, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. As all-in Christians, we can expect to face some of the harshest circumstances imaginable in this world. But eternal life with Jesus awaits. We may weep now as the world rejoices. Jesus is calling one of you. <laughs> we may weep now as the world rejoices, but we will laugh and celebrate with the, the Lord for all eternity. In other words, disciples of Jesus can endure the world's rejection because they already have heaven's acceptance. That's here and now. When we have loud, wailing grief over the state of the world and our own sin, and, and, and in response we go all in with a full ad attitude of obedience for this upside-down kingdom that is God's, we will be filled and rejoice. We're not doing woes this week. That comes later. But remember, I said the whole thing builds off itself. But I want to make a point of the corresponding woe to come. The corresponding woe is straightforward. Those who are full now, happy, content, enjoying life despite the spiritual devastation around them, content, enjoying life despite the spiritual devastation around them, will hunger and those who laugh now, just living it up, totally unconcerned with giving up every area of their life to the lordship of Jesus Christ, will mourn and weep. Those who desire human praise more than identification in Christ may have easier lives on earth, but they will suffer in eternity. When Jesus is preaching this, and we're still in the first couple of verses, he just started this sermon these all-inners are getting a threefold message when they hear that the poor, hungry, and weeping are blessed. The message is the spiritually lacking will be satisfied, the physically lacking will be satisfied, those who lack because they serve him will be rewarded and satisfied. So what have we learned so far? We come for one thing. But God often surprises us with responses we don't expect. And our attitude to that response is telling. This matters. Because if we trust him and say we're all in, the outcome will be much better than we could have ever imagined. Remember, obedience proves the relationship. And God rewards those who diligently seek him. Do you know what that in-between space is called between blessed are and will have? How do you get from him saying, blessed are you who are this, to the you will have this? What's that liminal space in between? It's faith and obedience. Those who hunger will have faith and obey, and they'll be blessed. Those who weep have faith and obey, and they'll rejoice, they'll laugh. Faith and obedience are what the all-in attitude is made of. Did you come to hear that today? <laughs> it can be hard. When I read Jesus' blessings, I think maybe that place of poverty, hunger, and weeping is just where we need to be as disciples of Jesus. Because Jesus says clearly that it's when we're poor, we fully experience the riches of God's kingdom. When we're weak, he's strong. When we're hungry, we begin to find satisfaction with the most basic things, and that is so true. And we, when we are weeping, that we will be moved to joy and laughter. Blessed are the hungry, Jesus says, for they will be physically filled and the spiritually hungry will be filled with me. Blessed are those who weep with their struggles in life as well as weep on behalf of spiritual lack. They will know joy. 
Jesus is also saying, my all-in followers are to be merciful toward the poor, in spirit, hungry, and the weeping. You're not like to be the, like the, the judgmental religious people who cast them to the side. Those kinds of people may be satisfied now, but they might, they're probably going to suffer soon. When I think about a circumstance where someone proved they had an attitude of all in despite Jesus not doing or saying what they thought, I think of Thomas. But sometimes he tripped up in his attitude of all in. At one point, he became doubting Thomas. John 20, 27, 31 has the story. And we know that, you know, after Jesus rose from the dead, he showed up in a room with his disciples, but Thomas was not there. And later all the disciples said, Thomas, we saw our Lord. It was him. And Thomas was like, no, no, uh-uh. I, I, I did this before. I was all in. I came what he, to hear what he had to say, see what he had to do. I was all about it. And nothing turned out as it was supposed to. I will not believe unless I can touch him myself, see with my own eyes. So then Jesus finally shows up with Thomas in the room. And he says, Jesus focused his attention on Thomas. Take your finger and examine my hands. Take your hand and stick it in my side. Don't be unbelieving, believe. Thomas said, my master, my God. Jesus said, so you believe because you've seen with your own eyes? Blessed are those who believe without seeing. Isn't it funny the word chosen there? Blessed. Thomas wasn't all in for a little bit there, and he robbed himself of a blessing. Look, Jesus knows that, and he's fully aware that we could never grasp the idea of an upside down kingdom on our own. That's why he died for us. He set an example for us, gave us the Holy Spirit to empower us to obey him and remind us of his upside down kingdom manifesto. You are coming to church for a reason. You came with that reason as a curious attender, a casual follower, or an all-in disciple. God has, is, and will answer your questions and meet your needs in ways that are gonna surprise you, confuse you, or even anger you. I mean, Thomas didn't expect Jesus to conquer in the way he did. But if you trust him, and have an all-in attitude and follow through with obedience, you will experience things beyond your wildest dreams. You will be blessed, highly favored of God. Do you believe you have an all-in attitude? Bow your heads, I wanna pray. Lord, this message cut, cuts right to the heart, it does mine. I want an all-in attitude. I want to trust you when um, you say things and I believe you wholeheartedly, but it's not playing out as I expect. Lord God, help me to trust you and obey anyway. Blessed are those who believe without seeing, Lord God. I want that to be me. I want it to be all of us here. Lord God, and like Thomas, you knew he was going to struggle with this, but you met him where he was at. Lord God, I know you're going to meet us where we're at right now with no one looking around, if you need Jesus to meet you where you're at right now, I pray that you would raise your hand so I can pray with you.